first of all, I would like to thank Art Basel, um, especially Mari Spiritu and Anneli Graf for the invitation and organization of everything. And also to thank all the participants here and, um, and of course, all of you that came in the early morning. Um, so I will very briefly introduce our participants. Lara Amarsegui is an artist based in um, Rotterdam. Julien Charnier, Charrier, it's an artist based in Berlin. And Louise Farcho, it's founder and director of Art 2030 and Farcho Art Resources in Copenhagen. Um, okay, so just to give an introduction of what we are kind of talk here today. Um, the concept of cohabitation became important to me while observing the practice of some artists that would um, address new forms of subjectivities molded by the situation we do live in the planet for the last decades. Um, concerning exploitation of labor, extraction of minerals and its consequences, always from a critical and micro-political position. In this sense, cohabitation extends beyond the mutual agreement to live with another person or to coexist as animals of different species. Somehow, it deconstructs the whole modern idea of a universal man, of um, linear history or of a linear time, having progress and development and therefore extraction of minerals and production of capital as the priority over lives, environments, and all the different worlds that cohabit the planet. To quote, to quote one of the, theoretic the theoreticians that um, has been dealing with this notion for more than 30 years now, Donna Haraway, based in California, she would say, we are talking about cohabitation between different sciences and forms of culture between organisms and machines. Uh, I think the issues that really matter, who lives, who dies, and at what price, these political questions are embodied in technoculture. And this is, um, she's known uh, for writing the Cyborg Manifesto in, in California in 1985, I guess, or 84. And then another very quick quote by Bruno Latour from Paris, um, I was very influenced by the parks in Kenya, which tend to arise from a cosmopolitics, so that we understand what cohabitation we are talking here. Okay, back to the quote. Um, you have to take into account, at the same time, the development of the Kenyan population. Lions, plants, birds, Japanese tourists, creditors from the World Bank, donations from NGOs, without being able to subtract any of these actors. What we are dealing with are differences of worlds. So this is just um, so that we try to understand this kind of cohabitation of different worlds. Um, and considering these ideas and the practice of artists that deal in uh, very singular ways with these matters, the first title for this panel was uh, Cohabitation, Ecosystems and Impact. And the second title, What is Wrong with Ecological Art, came later on in discussions, uh, maybe from my own skepticism, with the notion of ecological war. So I would like just to bring up and put it in, on the table. Um, in principle, I do not agree with labels for artistic practice and artworks, be it ecological art or social practice, uh, for very basic reasons. Like I believe labels restrict the relation with artworks to verbal and linear understanding rather than expanding and unfolding their presence in the world. But we can also discuss later on why I would prefer to use the term ecosystems instead of um, ecology, if this um, comes up in our conversation with the participants. So I would like to invite Lara Masegi to talk about her practice, and then I think these ideas will get more clear as each one of them presents. Thank you. Okay. Hello, thanks for this invitation and this opportunity to continue the conversation with Ana Paula and get to know Julian's work and Luis. So um, to say it fast, uh, my practice as an artist starts uh, very much from looking around me, seeing what is around me, walking around the cities, uh, a city, and seeing what's, what's around, which is basically uh, buildings and constructions and architecture and more constructions and more design. So basically, I always had the feeling, uh, constant feeling that there is too much construction around me. This uh, has pushed me to develop a practice as an artist where uh, I am trying to uh, stand against all this architecture and construction 
stand against the state of things where everything is built and designed and try to do something about it. Basically, putting these buildings in pieces as a way to understand them, as a way to obviously destroy them and criticize them and uh, think about the land and how it is destroyed for construction. Should we put the first image? So something I have been doing a lot uh, as a way to understand buildings and constructions is to analyze what a building is made of or what the city is made of. So I've been uh, basically counting construction materials, finding out how much concrete is necessary to make a building or even to make a city, a Sao Paulo, for example, with Ana Paula. <laughs> And this image you are seeing is a project I did in Vienna in Secession. We calculate the amount of construction materials used to make the art center, and then we show them inside. So we are, you are looking at a heap. The biggest is a heap. Ah, I can stand. That's a bit more. You wake up. <laughs> this is 98 cubic meters of brick, 50 cubic meters of mortar, concrete, sand, polystyrene, uh, plaster all the materials you need to make a building, thinking about what a building is made of, what is the origin of construction, and thinking what is the future of construction. When a building is demolished, that's what you have, the rubble, the ruin of the building. Uh, I have been doing a lot of these installations with construction materials, enlisting the materials, thinking uh, what things are made of, destroying the buildings. And then lately, I continue with the question of where these materials come from, and then I hit the question of the underneath, what lays below the land, what lays below the city. Could you pass the image? Yeah. So I hit, I hit the question of the mineral rights, which I think for American people is very uh, well known. Maybe in Europe uh, we are less familiar to it. Mineral rights, uh, it is a, a legal structure that uh, based on the idea that the ownership of the underneath, the resources under the land, are different than the uh, ownership of land. So for example, in Switzerland, you can buy land, but you cannot buy the resources below, or in Germany, in Spain, in France. In most countries in Europe, the underneath, the resources, they are owned by the government, by the state. And as a normal citizen, you cannot have them. So you can, own, you can live in a building and someone else owns below the, your building. For example, in Rotterdam, the owner of the city is a shell, shell company. So based on the structure of things, what I did is I developed a project where I tried to own uh, mineral rights of iron ore, of uh, an iron deposit. Uh, I like iron because it's the cheapest mineral, but of course it's very basic for construction. This building here is made of iron, I mean, and asphalt and concrete, but iron is very important in the structure. So I tried to get a deposit of iron. I tried in Spain, in Germany, in many countries they didn't allow me because I'm not a mining company. But I finally got uh, uh, an iron concession in Norway. That's what you're looking at. It's my concession that is one square kilometer, one kilometer by one kilometer. It's not very, very large, but it is very deep because the mineral rights, they, uh, they last from the, la from the land to the middle of the earth. So actually it's pretty, pretty deep. Yeah, I'm quite, uh, <laughs> I'm very proud of that. So I, I think I really hit very, very deep this time. They are for nine years, yes, nine years. Uh, but what I find very exciting about them is that they are exclusive. And I don't like to, so much the word of exclusivity, but for this project it's important because this means that because I own this iron ore, no one else can own them. So Shell cannot own them. As Lormitel, biggest uh, iron company, maybe in the world, cannot have them. So they are mine, uh, therefore they are protected, and no one else can have them. Can you pass the image? So that's the place, you can see the, the photo. And because I have these mineral rights, the iron is protected. Architects cannot use it, they cannot build with it. But of course the trees are protected, the stones are protected, uh, everything. Uh, which is, well, the iron takes just 300,000 million of years to generate, and that's quite some time that is destroyed for extraction, and this is what I am stopping. And then, of course, I'm uh, presenting this whole situation of ownership of resources. So my question for you would be, whom owns below your city or whom owns below Basel, mm -hmm. something like that, and what lays below? Mm, thank you. So Julian, if you would like something. Yeah, hello. Thank you for inviting me here uh, to this talk. Maybe you can put the first picture directly so it's easier. Um, 
I think I've been invited here uh, because I'm also kind of interested uh, on this issue about material and a negative space in a, in a different way. We, we have been showing together, actually, we didn't knew that, but we showed together in Predella uh, in the same space. Um, for me, um, the, in my work, I'm trying to investigate on the different layer of time, which are maybe suggested to a certain place, landscape, or entity. The entity can be like here an iceberg, but can be a lithium mine in Bolivia or an exclusion zone in Chernobyl. I don't know if some of you saw um, the piece that I have in the back of Unlimited with my friend Julius von Bismarck. Um, so, yeah, so like I'm, I'm very interested in the fact that we um, have kind of an issue uh, nowadays to understand um, what uh, time and tempor temporalities or different temporalities means. And I um, try to give some hints or actually just try to analyze that in, in certain given situations. So here, it's a work which is called um, Blue Fossil and Tropic Stories. It's from 2013 and actually uh, climb an iceberg in the Arctic Ocean and try to melt it down for eight hours with a, a, a blowtorch. And uh, for sure, for m most of the people, uh, we see kind of an example of a global warming or criticize of global warming situation, which is in one hand uh, correct. But for me, it was also about trying to get into this uh, different layer of, of information because an iceberg is a 30,000 years old piece of ice which is melting apart and which contain so much information which are kind of like crystallized into the ice and probably some of you are aware of like the drill coring in the Arctic where they uh, go three kilometer under the Greenland to kind of understand what the ecosystem were looking like um, in the year before. And um, I think it's, it's a work which is pretty much a good example of, of um, this, this um, my volunteer to actually bring back human in the picture. I think that we, we actually have the um, this separation which we inherited from romanticism, where man is always like put as an observer. And um, in my work, I tend to try to find places where man and his surrounding are in like a friction and, and in this, this, this case you see a person on the top of the iceberg just actually uh, interacting directly which was in underneath instead of like being just outside as, a, as an uh, of, of a, over entity which is just analyzing. Maybe you can go to the next, next one. So this is... Um, uh, another walk um, on the sidewalk, I forget the dinosauria. And uh, those are drill core, core sample, which are coming from different cities, but different cities, different uh, mine where the material to build the cities is coming from. And it's like all this uh, history. As when we're talking about history today, we're talking about like a timeline which is horizontal, linear and uh, with maybe Jesus in the middle, but when we're actually thinking about, about history, history is uh, very complex and going in a different direction. When we think about geology, it's actually everything there, and, and everything is kind of like vertical and hidden under the surface, and what I'm trying to do is to actually show this different temporality and different history which are running parallelly, but not uh, not at the same uh, same speed. So I think we we need to re-understand the fact that we have like different uh, velocity in one system, and that's what makes our reality so complex. And I think that's um, an, an 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 easy way to make that visible to actually try to bring this. Uh, like time storage and to make kind of like a time college, which is much more complex than what you will see normally in an history book, which is very subjective. Yesterday we talked about archaeology. Archaeology can always be very subjective. You take the event that you want to take and you 
kind of put apart what don't interest you or what, what you want to hide. And in geology, nothing is hidden, everything is there. And I just kind of like uh, mingle a little bit with, uh, with those material. And maybe we can go to the next one. Um, that's like one of uh, my latest piece, which is in, in uh, Venice right now, in Arsenale. And uh, that's again um, a walk which is about extraction, geology, what is underneath, what is kind of like this idea of uh, eternal return. Here we see the negative space of a small lithium mine uh, in Bolivia, Salar de Unidas, sitting on the biggest lithium deposit worldwide, which is um, very necessary uh, to actually sustain the velocity of uh, our society and, and a will for progress. At the same time, we, we are in front of like a landscape which takes 30,000 years to crystallize. It's a very slow sedimentation process. It's actually a sea which were uh, between two mountain chains and which slowly dry out. And the sea is still underneath, so they dry out but went through and now we are on the, on the top of it as a salt flat. And for this lithium production, uh, people in Bolivia, I think, is very nice because those are, are families, they're very small very small uh, mining, like almost uh, artisania, as it's like a two or three people entreprise. And they're actually cutting the desert and create uh, some pool where they bring the water back to the surface. So they're reenacting the idea of this archaic landscape in, in a way which is uh, for sure for capitalistic reason. And, and, and the idea is to create profit because it's a very poor country and they need it, but uh, somehow there is something uh, highly romantic about this idea of reenacting a landscape and the idea which is just hidden underneath, but then um, in this case, it's also very tangible and physical because you're like, and at some point just in front of a sea, which is kind of like this uh, idea of, of the sea and then it's just brought to the surface. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's like kind of uh, what I'm doing and try to do. Uh, maybe I can say two words about the the work in the back. Uh, the work in the back is about emancipation, so a human being trying to emancipate. When we're talking about velocities, or trying to emancipate from their own system. So we have like some NASA footage uh, cut together with the reflection of the surrounding uh, of a deer in the exclusion zone in Chernobyl. So it's about, it's about like an emancipation of the planet through space conquest. And then it's about a non-human space where we actually ban ourselves from our direct surroundings through our action. And, 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 um, and they're just like put together as a kind of a highly subjective but non-human point of view. I mean like, point of view of humanity uh, through the 60 millimeter camera of the astronaut in the cockpit of Apollo, just um, next to the deer, which is used as an interface because we brought like a camera on the eye of the deer and is actually free, free to look at what he wants. And that's the footage that we actually use to kind of um, create this tension between both system uh, with Julius. I think that's maybe uh, an introduction. This, this is the film that it's in unli yeah, out on limit, so we could watch afterwards the conversation. Thank you, Julia. So, Louise, please. Thank you. Well, I'm Louise Farasco, and uh, to put it very shortly, uh, to introduce myself, I have been in the art world for more than 30 years. Uh, I. Uh, established Galerie Fausco in 1986 together with my partner and uh, then in 2011 we um, we founded Fausco Foundation in Copenhagen and Beijing and in 2015 I moved on uh, to to uh, found Art 2030 um, simply to put art in, um, uh, in to reinstate art in a bigger global context. So Art 2030's uh, vision is to connect art and the UN global goals. 
to, to explain the global goals very briefly. It's a very ambitious um, plan the, with 17 uh, global goals uh, for how we can move the world into a more sustainable direction. And the strength of it is that these 17 global goals, they uh, are very much interlinked. Uh, for instance, we can't solve climate problems without looking into poverty. We can't sol er eradicate poverty without looking into equal rights. Uh, we can't solve equal rights without looking into women's rights, children's education, uh, health, etc., etc., etc. And uh, perhaps I could have the first image. Uh, this is uh, a project we are uh, inaugurating this coming Tuesday because uh, June 20th is the World Refugee Day. And uh, on occasion of that, we are inaugurating this piece uh, by Ai Weiwei uh, at the Charlottenburg uh, Kunsthalle in Copenhagen. Uh, it's uh, Ai Weiwei made this piece uh, for Charlottenburg and but not the least uh, for the world's refugees. It consists of three and a half thousand life jackets that has been collected at uh, Lesbos in Greece um, and has been worn by uh, the people who is trying to uh, get to Europe. So the uh, Ai Weiwei collected them, and he has now barricaded sort of the window to the Kunsthalle. Um, and that's a very good example of, of the, the, the vision of Art 2030, meaning that we need, um, we want to collaborate with, first and foremost, the artist, of course, uh, but also with the institution, the Kunsthalle, but bringing it outside um, the institution, so to speak, because I very much trust in, in art's ability to, to uh, both identify and, and uh, articulate, discuss, and visualize very complex uh, agendas. And so, um, and that, of course, it re, uh, Ai Weiwei's piece here uh, very much uh, aims to, to put focus on the humanitarian crisis we have and to, to, um, to keep that focus. Uh, we will have a lot of discussions and talks, etc. cetera, but uh, to me, it's very much also about the cohabitation. And cohabitation we, uh, and is on many levels, perhaps you could Take the next images. This will be a close-up of the um, uh, the life jackets. Um, it's it is really a very beautiful but also heartbreaking piece. Um, and to continue on cohabitation, I will take the next image. No, uh, Shirin is that? Mm, I thought it was number three. Could you move on? Yes. This is uh, Shirin Nassad. It's actually in, on display in Venice right now. But uh, Shirin may, went to um, Azerbaijan and made a series of portraits of, uh, of people from Azerbaijan, various ages and, and um, uh, ethnicity. And the reason why she chose Azerbaijan, because it's it's one society, but it, it really comes from all over your, the, uh, the world. And so she put these, she wrote, uh, she interviewed the persons and um, wrote their stories uh, on, with ink on their portraits. But if you see it together, it's such a striking image of very different uh, histories, persons, uh, uh, ethnicities, and we, and it's an ex another example of how to address cohabitation. Uh, and if I should perhaps bring it back to you, um, and the title that we will be discussing, I'm sure, um, 
I think cohabitation is really, really very important on very many levels. Um, and in, in, in regards to the notion of ecological art, if we look at ecology, in my opinion, what it is, is a, it is a system of how uh, all living creatures live together and the, the environment they live in. S uh, and, and as art has always been, um, throughout history, art has always been uh, a way for us to, to understand ourselves in the context we are living in. And to me, um, well, the, some of the most important issues we have to address uh, uh, at this time uh, of history is, is climate change and, and uh, well, immigration uh, and, and overall cohabitation. So, yeah. Thank you. So, um, we have been discussing a little bit before this conversation in public about this ecosystems or um, ecology. And I think the, the main point is that ecology is already um, like a discipline or something that will address um, a topic in a very specific way. So somehow I think it's in the same paradigm of this modern man and linear history and linear time. Well, maybe if we talk about ecosystem, because you said it's a system in plural, we could think of this cohabitation in terms of um, each uh, world that like, there's, a, there's an anthropologist uh, from Brazil called Eduardo Viveiros de Castro that since the 70s has been questioning, let's say, um, the whole um, idea of anthropology um, in, in terms of uh, thinking that he, he will put the, the concept of multiculturalism um, in contrast, let's say, or in um, conflict with the idea of multinaturalism because he would think of uh, multiculturalism will understand that the world is full of different cultures and we need to find ways to study all these cultures. And while multinaturalism uh, will understand that naturalism in the Latin coming from natura, so different worlds, different systems, cosmo, cosmo visions, ecosystems. Uh, if we, we think that in one planet we have many different worlds uh, and then the question is how to how to cohabitate or how to respect these different worlds. And a very basic example happens in Brazil for since for the last 500 years, but it's happening now. Like if we think of the um, Amazon forest and how, you know, the idea of progress and development of nation state Brazil, it's really focused on, for instance, water power plants in the forest. And when they do this in order to sell aluminum to, to China, they disconsider all the more than 250 um, ethnic different backgrounds that are living there on all the animals and all the plants. So it's all the different worlds in, in the same space. So you kill it all in order to, to build this um, water plants. But anyway, just coming back to what we saw here and coming back to your presentations, I think um, I would think it's important to differentiate a little bit the idea of uh, micropolitics and macropolitics. And I would, I, I think here we have a very um, interesting examples in the sense that I would believe that artists would address the world in this, in this micropolitical forces. So somehow if we think that the piece of, um, not land, but underneath land that Lara bought will not uh, have a cause and effect, so it's not like, okay, she bought this piece and now the planet is saved. It's really a symbolic gesture in order to bring awareness to all of us of what's happening. And I would like you maybe to talk about this or also in Julianne's talk, I think in, you mentioned many times the, the act of not being passive humans and just observe the changing of geological world of a bigger context, but being active somehow. And I think the image of you like burning the iceberg in um, melting down the iceberg, like just one little woman being there for eight hours. Again, it's, it's, it's more like activating this um, micro-political forces where it brings this awareness of things. And uh, while I, I believe um, 
the project of Louise, it's connecting both. So it's a macro-political in the way that you connect to the UN and you really have this because macro-political will be like, okay, we have these laws and we're gonna change them and we're gonna, it's really like in the visible world while the micro-politicals, I feel they will, like artists and artistic practice will um, open cracks uh, underneath symbolically, but in this case um, also um, in the real world. And um, one other point that I think is interesting to think is that both of you deal with matter. So even if we think of micropolitics and dealing with these invisible forces or artist practice as something that will change things in ways that we cannot see immediately, I think both of you are dealing with matter. And, and so even if bringing it from the un underneath, it's very important for us to kind of see things from another perspective. So if uh, each of you want to, to say something about it. No, but it's just that I, the, I, artists can really, in a very, uh, can, can uh, the, the universal language of art can exactly address these very complicated uh, matters, but do it in a way that we reach people's hearts and minds so in very with very many different artistic practices i think it's important that we uh, what we wish to do is basically to to put focus on these very many different artistic practices in order if we want to bring the world into a more sustainable direction I mean, on a global level, uh, we have basically we have to engage everybody, and and what uh, it's, it's, it mean, it has to feel relevant for all of us. So, it's the it's the sm many small actions. I mean, seven billion small actions. That's a ma that's a major uh, movement. So, I I think we it, we simply have to make it relevant for for everybody to if, engage in this. If I may um, just intervene so that we start the conversation Sorry. and then after a while we're gonna open up for, for, for the audience for conversation. I think the main problem is, is with everybody because if we, you think there's, there's some um, indigenous people from Brazil for instance that doesn't even know about the climate change and they don't want to know, they're not interested in learning Portuguese or having a citizenship so it's, uh, and, and Bruno Latour talks a lot about that, about the idea of the UN as, as being like a flat, believing that all these cultures are on top and, and, uh, and, and, not every, and everyone should need a little chair there. And if we think that some people don't even know what a chair is, just to put it in discussion, like w the everybody notion is a universal notion coming from Europe, but I think even this needs to be questioned, not in your speak specifically, just for our thinking here. The reply? It's okay if you reply. It's just that I don't want, I don't mean when I say everybody to engage, mm -hmm. not in the same way. We have different resources. We have, I mean, I'm not, I don't want us to do the same thing, yeah. but having the awareness and then act with the possibilities we, uh, and ways we find right. Mm -hmm. yeah, Ours is very difficult. Um, for us uh, European to think like the system of the indigenous in the in the rainforest. I mean, like when I'm talking, when I'm walking, I need to walk with the tools that I have and that I learn. So um, that's why in what I'm doing, I'm a lot of time trying to reconcile the kind of like body and and material because I think that that's something which is needed uh, nobody more than ever to kind of recreate an emotional link to the territorium and to like uh, my feet, my body, my, my brain, and, and probably the ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, we living in a, a, a society which is uh, so much about progress and velocity and speed that we actually don't understand this link anymore because the body is kind of uh, erased somehow in, 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 in our iPhone and everything that we have as tools but, and, and that's why I can't understand maybe like exactly what you was meaning because I, I understand the, the, the concept of Latour and the cosm multiplicity and that we have a, a problem to actually bring that together. But 
uh, it's, it's very uh, difficult nowadays. So I'm, I'm trying in my work to just uh, articulate something that I can feel and then uh, bring that envy back. But that's a very uh, kind of occidental-oriented point of view because it's very difficult for me to kind of get out of that. Yeah. So uh, I think that's kind of like one of the main problems that we have to articulate today, no? Yeah, but it's more about being aware of this. And, and I'm from Brazil, but I'm a also Western, Westernized culture. So the whole world, if we think of the, the idea of, instead of, of saying globalization, if you think of the unify, how do you call the Gata, he would say in 1969, the, the capital, the mundial capital unified. So the whole world is already uh, either Eastern, uh, Western or Westernized culture somehow. So it's just a matter of uh, trying not to think of universal generalizations, but each of us to speak specifically of, of different contexts. That's what I meant. That's why I don't believe in everybody, but it was not, um, I think it's just a way of speaking, but just also to bring this awareness and then you do your work. For sure you were dealing with uh, the act of creation and this is always singular and it will always be uh, specific in my, in my view from the relation you can have with uh, you, uh, Lara, you want to talk? Oh, yeah. yeah, I was just thinking uh, related to your discussion. So yeah, I have been looking at a lot of destruction of nature in cities for a while, going against city planners and developers, and then one time I realized actually the destruction in cities compared with the destruction in mining in the countryside is nothing. Mining is really, really big scale destruction. And then just jumping into your conversation, in Europe, actually, there is a lot of destruction going on in the richer countries, in the western, former Western Germany near Cologne and Aachen, the biggest mine, coal mine you can't imagine, just to extract the brown, cheapest coal to burn it and make electricity, and they just consume, extract, consume it in five hours, you know? So it's not that mining is something from the far away third world. Many people think that, that's very optimist, but there's a lot of mining going on. Say that I also must say, uh, my position very much as an artist is to talk about the place where I am, maybe because I like to question why I talk here at this moment and just because we are here. So basically, and then, and then it's kind of uh, safer, I'm talking about what uh, Soran asked, but it's also a bit political. I mean, I really believe on the power of the local and really this, this kind of uh, micro politics. I think that's, I understand the work is global very much. Things affect things that affect things. But I really think I can do action and I can produce change really right now here. Um, for example, being in uh, <laughs> Messe Basel, which is kind of the most strange uh, non-existing place in the world because it's a, it's a temporary biggest art for in the world. What I like to say is how much iron has this building and I really do, I'm serious about it. I think I like to think about where we are, what is in the floor, what is below. When I had the presentation uh, in the art fair here with my galleries, Ellen De Bruyne, like, I don't know, four years ago, what we did, we calculated the materials of the art fairs. So I really like to talk about where I am to, to, co to call awareness because there is a lot going on and I think it's interesting to know where you are. But I think that's also where I can be powerful and I can have action. And uh, yeah, I really like to talk about uh, what is below. For example, what is below my city in Rotterdam. There is uh, an amazing gas extraction and oil extraction. There are a lot of things going on. But I think it's interesting to, to talk about what is below because then we can relate to everyone that is in the room. And then somehow it touches us, not as different, like, oh, but you are from there, I'm from here. But as like thinking together in this very space. And then maybe you can mention the work you did uh, here in, in Basel, in the Kunst, uh, Kunsthalle, was it? Yeah, yeah, too bad. I, I, yeah. to uh, no, it was the building. It was about the construction. I made a list of all the construction materials used to make the building. Um, I should have brought it, but yeah, yeah. three images. Uh, yeah, sorry. So I just described and depict all the construction materials, but the amount. So like uh, 3,000 tons of iron, 5,000 tons of concrete. And so I came like two months before the exhibition and I had a talk with the technicians of the art fair that, that give me the plans and we identified the material. So just saying what things are made for, made of to rethink about the moment of the construction, the destruction involved in it and what happened with the demolition, mm -hmm. which, yeah, uh, yeah. By, by the way, it all get demolished at a certain point, moment, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 
a lot of hours for, uh, in 2006 for eight months, calculating with engineers and city organizations the weight of the city of Sao Paulo. And then the, her work was the listing of all the materials that, that will um, consist in the city that we live. Um, and maybe just to interrupt, just to say that this work of the construction materials, I think there's a big link with your work with the drillings. Yeah, I was going That's to ask about this related. one. But with the, the matters that, with the cut, I don't know if everyone is as familiar with this um, geological tool. It's really a tool, a technical tool, right, that they use yes. to cut the, the underneath and bring it up? Yeah, it's like a core sampling to actually analyze what is underneath in mining, but also in geology or archaeology to see, like, the layer. And what I was saying is, like, that these different uh, systems which are kind of, like, uh, encapsulate these uh, huge temporalities and I'm bringing them to the surface or they're bringing them to the surface and I'm using them in an alternative way to actually make visible what you make visible maybe with uh, the weight and quantity but in kind of a more an, um, anecdotic way like to have the building, the stone from the building, like everything in, in one and that's just showing um, maybe I need to exemplify that with another work which I do, I mean like at the end of the day, what we will left over uh, is a huge amount of material which is misplaced. Huh? So if your iPhone falls down, then you will have like some mineral which don't belong to the place at this place. And that's what actually our civilization will just let behind us if we're singing in the scale of like geological deep time. And um, that's, I think that's like this drill core. It's a possibility to make that visible in a very um, uh, smaller scale because you can can see your direct surrounding in, in this kind of like geological forest, but up appearing and, and connecting in a um, broken timeline or, or a multi-directional timeline. What about the radiation uh, the project? Ra <laughs> yeah, the radiation project is the same. I mean, it's not the same thing, but it's also about a broken timeline because the moment... Uh, I think um, we don't have the capacity with our senses to grasp uh, radiation because radiation is something which is overwhelming in time of time scale, which is kind of like going into direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, the moment where like um, thermonuclear explosion happen, it's very quick. Like what uh, in the atomic kind of scale happen, it's something that we cannot understand as well as we can understand a supercomputer making some calculation about stock stock market. But then also we can't understand the time that uh, radioactivity stay along. And it's actually a marker for humanity again, because we imprint ourselves in an artificial way in the geology, in the stone. Like the isotope will stay for over 300 million years. So when we'll not be there anymore, we will still be able to look at certain artificial created isotope of the 60s as the first moment that we actually put ourselves in this kind of geological scale. But at the same moment, I think it's a very interesting place of friction because we, um, we are like in front of something which is, um, which the viscosity is very high. So we, we cannot like grasp it and understand it. And I think that's make that's make aware that we have a problem about um, this temporality I was talking about, like this time scale. And that's so it's a place where it's, uh, it's, it's very obvious that we have a problem about them because we just putting something in the wall which will just go further and further out of control and somehow uh, out of um, the shame of our senses. So it's, uh, it's an, a non-human entity which is created by us, and the same as global warming, but it's, it's maybe uh, e easier to understand it in terms of like, like uh, this atom testing. That's why I've been like yeah. going to these places and, and, and try to make some visual research about it. So. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was very interesting because it's something that we know what it is and many people feel in their bodies, but it's invisible. And then uh, Julian is making images where you can see, I don't know how, but Do actually, you capture, yeah. or it's more like a the radiation? Fiction? No, but like radiation has been discovered by Becquerel in uh, 1896. Uh, he put some uranium salt on a photosensitive plate, 
in a dark room and so that the, 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 the material was actually radiating, so there was actually light. And, uh, but, there, but there is no light going to the picture, so they just discovered that photo uh, sensitive material will uh, make visible some gamma or some other rays that the eye will not be able to grasp, and that's what I'm trying to uh, show in this picture. So I'm showing the landscape, but I'm showing what is uh, underneath this landscape, but not, but not like uh, able to be visible for our senses because we're very limited as human beings. So we're yeah. very and. So yeah. in the yeah in the images we see the landscape and we can kind of yeah see I mean there's see a double the exposition yeah. yeah it's like one lens like one picture of the landscape and the landscape put on the picture which make a second imprint mm, mm, on the negative yeah. yes yeah beautiful and scary at the same time Louise I would like to ask you about your uh, what kind of um, connection you have with the UN um, I think we also talk about that what for me, it will be somehow all this thinking of changing of paradigm uh, from linear to like suddenly cohabitation and simultaneous realities and different worlds uh, will somehow question the whole paradigm of uh, the nation state. Um, and then, uh, but this in a more conceptual level, we discuss a lot about this identity and how somehow we are still, our subjectivities are still molded by national identity. And then I just wonder, like I would like to hear more about your connection of like artists and micropolitics with the United Nations, um, like in a practical way, how this would happen. And, and it's in, I think it's interesting for us to hear. We are an independent, non-for-profit organization, an NGO, and that is very deliberate. So we have, we are in very close dialogue and, and collaboration with the United Nations, but it's crucial to be independent because uh, we, we want to um, touch upon the d discussion, but we sort of need this arm, arm length uh, to, to order, I mean, you can't do a project with, with, with as the one we're doing with Ai Weiwei uh, if you should have uh, acceptance in the UN. So you have to address, I think it's, uh, it's possible to work together. Uh, uh, for instance, marking the, the World Refugee Day, sort of support, uh, collecting a lot of, of um, discussion and awareness about it. But yet, we are. This is an individu individual, uh, an independent project. So we uh, we uh, we enjoy sort of a very close relation, but we are clearly independent. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm interested to hear more about this tension. How is it tension in a productive way? Like how how would you think of this? Well, of course, the United Nations is a very big and also bureaucratic system, uh, uh, and I'm dealing as little with that part of it as possible. Uh, but I still think that the the uh, structure, uh, the the global goals, is really a very very deep uh, uh, agenda. The, which that's, uh, that that is based upon, I mean, expertise in uh, in in in, in ref the individual goals. I mean, for instance, uh, uh, how do we deal with poverty? That's like, I mean, every, all the expertise there is discussing that. So, it's. Um, uh, and I think it's important. To, the reason why we are connecting to it is that that uh, we need uh, it, uh, this in-depth knowledge mm -hmm. for for uh, from scientists, uh, all sorts of of people that works in depth with each of it. But then we have to see the how it's interlinked in order to to um, uh, as we talked about. We, Sometimes you can, we were talking about briefly about uh, how you, uh, the planting of trees, that you might think that you were doing uh, um, a good thing about bringing in a, uh, a new species somewhere, but it can actually affect the local ecosystem very much. And, in, and so I think we need 
the, the, the experts in each their field. And then I think it's very important that we work uh, across sectors, mm -hmm. which is some of the projects we're working on onwards is, uh, um, is very much with artists, scientists, scientists um, uh, philosophers, I mean, very cross sectors. I think this is another, um, let's say, line that cross the practice of the three of you, like you need to collaborate in dif different disciplines. I was thinking like how Lara also um, connects this micro-political, let's say, gesture that I called symbolic when she buys this land, but also how um, you really own the rights for this, so it's about laws and it's about reality. And I was wondering how, um, which kind of negotiation you have with the institution that hosts these projects and what it's shown, let's say, how do you communicate this to the art audience or to the audience in general? Maybe that's interesting to you. Yeah, it's a nightmare. This project of getting the mineral <laughs> rights, it's a nightmare. Just to be very fast, let's say I start this project in the north of Germany where they basically kick me out of the Hanover Geological Institute. Like, do you think we are gonna give you the German resources to an artist, a Spanish? Well, you know, like, they kick me out. In the Spanish office, they didn't kick me out, but they also told me, Lara, for what you wanna do, we will never let you have the mineral rights. And all, well, a, a very long network uh, brought me to um, the knowledge that in Norway, young country, they really believe everyone has the right to have mineral rights. Mm -hmm because you cannot buy them. It's more a, a, like a, a legal contract with the government. So you, you make a contract uh, uh, where you uh, say that you are gonna explore its uh, exploration rights and the price is like 110 euros by year in Norway. In Austria, it's 16 euros. So it's extremely cheap. It's not a matter of money or power. A tone, right? Uh, it's 60 euros a tonne. No, 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 no. The price ah, to the have price the, the rights. mineral Sorry. rights, okay. yeah, to have uh, uh, one square kilometer, well, 800 meter circle in Austria till the middle of the earth and one square kilometer till the middle of the earth is 110 euros. Oh. I think it's like a passport. You don't say I buy a passport. You have the right or not. And if you have it, you pay 30 euros, you get your passport, but you don't buy it. Yeah. So it is a extremely n uh, complex negotiation that is impossible in Germany and Spain, for example, and possible in Austria and Norway. And the uh, art centers that uh, stand uh, behind me, uh, they go with it with me. It's very complicated. Normally I have help by geologists. And also in my past projects, I have a lot of help by architects, a lot, a lot. And, and I must say that in general, uh, architects understand what I want very well. We help each other. They help me on the production, on the calculations, on the research. Also on the first, the first time I arrive to a city, I often meet with architects. They tell me what's going on in the map. They know a lot. They share the knowledge. They are generous. We really understand each other very well. With geologists uh, and mineral rights, it's a bit more complicated, I must say. So I'm generalizing, there are exceptions. But geologists, I don't know how it's working for you, but they tend to have more problems to accept uh, an artist wants to work with these issues. Maybe because geology is a science that started for mining. It's almost a branch of mining in the 1900s in, in England when it started. So for most geologists, the idea of a project that is so radically against mining Studying against mining is a bit problematic, so it takes me, or because I am more new in it, but somehow communication with geologists is more complicated than with architects, that's for sure. I don't know how it's for you, Julian. Yeah, it would be nice to hear also, Julian, about your collaborations for each project. Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, using a lot of scientific uh, methodology somehow. Oh. <laughs> um, but uh, in, an, uh, in an alternative way, somehow, and, and I'm not directly working with geologists, but I'm visiting a lot of mine. And it's always uh, very challenging because, as you say, there is, uh, there is also a profit and a huge kind of like company uh, above it which don't want you to get in. So I get in a very strange situation in, in, in a Mongolia, in China, where I was undercover probably undercover in the back of a pickup to actually visit a rare earth mine that I really wanted to. And I wanted to shoot like a movie with my iPhone, which uh, have been uh, requisitioned by, by the police at the end. So I'm, I get kicked out. So it's like, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit like walking on a half, kind of on the border of a legal way. But um, but what it shows, like in the, in the mining industry, you're never allowed to do any picture or recording. So you can, it's, 
it's not too complicated to get permission to visit, but it's very complicated to get permission to actually create kind of an iconography about those places. So that's why those places are very, some of me very attractive, because it's, um, because they're places which uh, are highly relevant and 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 and, and so strong in the world, and some are kind of like the involuntary monument. Of, uh, of our time, but, but nobody can really grasp them or see them because we're not allowed to, to build this picture. And in terms of like collaboration with other, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a lot of time trying to use some of the tools that scientific discipline are using, but they're using it in a very, uh, I mean, since the 19th century, it's always more uh, in one direction and it's going uh, deeper and deeper and deeper, but also like the spectrum is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and more concentrated. And that's like, um, I think in the most of like the university discipline today, a problem because everybody is just like a specialist and it's very difficult between the specialists to actually talk about one larger subject. And um, I'm, I'm trying to talk with the specialists to understand what they're using as tools and then um, just uh, taking those tools to create work which are not about speciality, but about maybe a larger picture. You know, I think it's very interesting how artistic practice and artists since the 50s, the more, the more radicals, but until today, are the ones that are like somehow crossing this um, different ex uh, expertises and then bringing them together in a way so that we can grasp them and understand. When you say this about how disciplines get more and more specific. And at the same time, uh, we have here, I think, examples of artists that yesterday, um, Luis brought up the idea of activism. And I think the work, when you describe how you make it, I mean, it's not just about one object, the one that you see here in the fair or that you see in the exhibition space, but it's a whole, like it's a, an, an expanded time where they do research for a long time in order to get to some point and to open it up to an audience in publications, talks, and, um, and exhibitions, but also somehow like um, navigating between all these expertises and then bringing something out of it. I don't know, did I interrupt you? No, no. Okay, <laughs> I was just thinking of how um, the three of you are somehow navigating in different um, mining fields. <laughs> to be a little, <laughs> and then um, bringing it together, for instance, now here in the discussion. Um, but it is so interesting. I mean, we are the time we're in. We are in such a big uh, shift of paradigms. So, of uh, of course, there is a lot of new ways. And well, it's we don't necessarily. Uh, one thing is certain: we don't know how anything looks in just a few years. Uh, the speed of things changing is so fast. The 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 basic shift of paradigms, the, the notion of values, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we, it's so uh, radical. So it's, I think it's an extremely exciting time uh, to, to work with all this. All, and, and even though you don't always know exactly where it's bringing you. Yeah. Yes. So um, we would be very happy if some of you um, can join our discussion with questions or comments. We still have 30 minutes. And um, I really encourage you to, um, to bring up some, to be part of the discussion here. Um, I think, uh, yeah, there's, um, she's with a microphone, probably because they are recording, so it's important to talk in the microphone. Um, yeah, please, here. Vielen Dank erstmal. Für mich war es jetzt sehr, sehr viel auf einmal. Es wäre mir lieber gewesen, wenn weniger gesprochen worden wäre, aber genau gesagt worden wäre, um was geht es denn in Wirklichkeit. Wenn wir jetzt sagen ökologische Kunst, ja, dann sag, frage ich mich, ja, äh, ökologische Kunst. Entschuldigung, ist, ich spreche keine Deutsch. Maybe he can translate ja, to us? Ja, gerne. I don't know. Can you, could you speak English? No. Okay, so, um, because I think the only one... Uh, I don't think you finished, right? No. 
<laughs> yeah, but just I'm just I'm just uh, telling you that I've, I'm sorry that I cannot understand, and I think Lara doesn't I mean, either. But you can you can speak. Uh, Okay, you do the question and then we see if uh, someone can translate to us. Sorry about that. Ja, es ist, finde ich, zu viel gesprochen worden, zu viel geredet worden, zu viel speziell. Und uh, das ist ja noch ein ganz neues Thema. Und mir wäre es lieber gewesen, dass man mal die Grundbegriffe geklärt hätte, um was es geht. Um, no, we speak too much and, and too, ma too many direction, but we didn't really focus on uh, what was like the question, because the question oh, is I like, knew this was going <laughs> and 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 that's um, that's we actually like that. Yeah, no, but you can you can talk otherwise, but I will respond later on. I'd, um, but then I will need to respond in English. That's a is that okay? You understand English? No. Because in the introduction, I mentioned why we have the question and how this is connected or not to the practice that we have here. So somehow it's not only about what about ecological art. Is this the question that he was interested in, the ecology what? thing? No, I think that, uh, that no, but I think that it was more about like the fact that uh, we didn't really focus on the topic, which were a bit clearer, but we just go in a lot of direction, kind of explaining about our different practices. Which, uh, because like the idea was a bit more of this kind of introduction and, and, and then maybe no to discuss the topic with you, so. But if, allow me to, to add on that. Um, it, it's a matter of, uh, you, if I understand your question correctly, it's the th term ecological art. To me, um, it's a wrong notion. Uh, artists that re, uh, has uh, always reflects on the time they're in, and which is of course the reason why this is on many more artist agenda today than previously. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's a it, it's been there for it's not a new thing. Uh, for instance, uh, is Joseph Boyce an ecological artist? Hmm. Well, to me, uh, Joseph Boyce is first and foremost a really, really good artist. Uh, you could uh, think of his uh, 7,000 oak trees in Castle as an ecological piece. Sure, to me, it's mostly a good piece. Uh, Robert Longo, is this an ecological artist? Hmm. Uh, well, Diane Tater, uh, I, I mean, the, the list is endless of artists. Uh, and also, you can even put it in a in longer art historical uh, um, view that at, that artists has always looked uh, on the time they're living in, the questions that is sort of uh, engaging, well, making us understand the time we live in, but also relating to nature and the systems we live in. So for me personally, uh, which was uh, what I tried to say in the beginning is that, fine, let's discuss ecological art. For me, it's, it's a limiting notion uh, because I think uh, um, the, the artist, of course, deals with is issues about ecology. But to me, it's just a... Um, they, good artists and good artworks can be interpreted at very many different uh, ways in, in different times. Yeah, but also when I talk about micropolitics and macropolitics, I do believe artists, um, they don't talk about things, they produce things that have a life of themselves and somehow they make a change or a transformation that it's not uh, direct, it's not, um, you know, like a cause and effect. It's not linear. So whenever you put a label like that on top of many artists producing very singular things and you say, this is ecological art, then you reduce their production into one um, subject. While I think here it was about singularity and that's why uh, it went to different uh, sides, let's say, because I do think it's all about the specificity and singularity. So 
the interest here was to go a bit, a bit deeper in the time we have and the work of each of them. Hope it's uh, more or less um, explained at least. Anyone else? Um, First of all, thank you very much for your talk. It was very, very interesting. And of course, I mean, all the categories we're using in art history are just helpful to, to use in terms of knowing what we're talking about. And I absolutely adore your practice, Lara, and also Julia, because um, I think they're also a very specific approach to storytelling. And I think maybe you can talk a little bit more on storytelling, because they create stories about a topic. I mean, climate change and also micropolitics and uh, micropolitics, they're very emotional and sometimes we translate it into data and try to make it more per perceptible uh, in terms of translating it into data, but data is also very raw and it's also kind of getting away from this emotional standard and then you have the, the other side of the context where people are really absolutely hit by the catastrophes happening all around the world and I think your approach is a bit more poetical and maybe also a bit more site-specific and maybe you can talk about the notion of storytelling and the stories you want to create in just a position maybe to the data you're translating into your pieces. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, it's a very nice and very good question. Um, and actually, I decided to be a visual artist to not have to answer it uh, because uh, I'm actually creating visual story about a uh, topic that I could translate in data. So uh, when I was talking earlier that uh, for me it's very important about the material and this connection between the body and the material because that's an emotional link that we kind of lost or that I have the feeling in our Western world we kind of lost. Um, and, and I'm trying to reconcile them uh, and, and that's the poetic about it, but I cannot really explain you what is the storytelling because um, if, if, if I could do that, I would have been a journalist or, or maybe uh, a writer and I would have done book instead of doing movies and pictures. And um, I think for me, like the visual at a s to a certain extent, um, a kind of a blurriness that you don't that you can't reach with word because words are, f are f for me at least, very much more precise. Um, like a picture as an uh, iconographic system always uh, let uh, a, a lot of um, hints and, 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 and way of trying to understand it and different perspectives that you can put on. And I think um, even a three-dimensional object, just the fact that you can go around it in a very physical way and it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's already giving like this plurality of, of perspective. And uh, I'm, I'm going to places, um, so that's, that's about storytelling. I'm bringing actually exponent back to, to these places because these places have like a phantasmagorical potential somehow. Sometimes they're very far, sometimes they're very secret, but they always have like a, kind of a strength, kind of like a, a vibration in them and are trying to bring that to the surface in a very subjective way, but that I have the feeling that people kind of resonate with. I mean, obviously you do. <laughs> that's, that's nice. Um, I don't know if that's an answer, but that's like, if, if you're going somewhere, you have always two, two different ways of approaching. In one way, be very empir empirical, but even in this empirical, that's what I was telling at the beginning, that's what we discussed yesterday, Archaeology tries to be empiric, history is trying to be empiric, but it's not. It's like, it's just a collage always of what... Always storytelling, yeah, no? It's, it's always fiction. It's always fictional, <laughs> exactly, it's always fictional. And, um, and in, in, in the way I'm approaching my surrounding, uh, it's also about fiction. Uh, and, and this fiction, are kind of, I, I bring them back in a, in a way which is uh, slightly different than than a scientist or a journalist we do. But I don't know if it's that an answer. Well, Not yeah. Really. Oh, thank you. About storytelling, I mean, there's a lot of things I can think. 
For sure, I, I must say to start with that the things I do, I really have to do and I do them. So if I talk about the mineral rights in Oslo or Graz, it's because I really got them. So, or when I say we wait, Sao Paulo, how much tons of concrete we really did was months of work. Sometimes there are years of research behind the project. And when I present it, the presentation is so condensed and I just show so little of the whole research that many people think I invented or the years of research are not behind. But actually, what is a stupid, really silly, almost masochist uh, thing is that actually I did the research and we, we work a lot for years on these things. So we really did it. So it is for sure. And for me, this is important. But I still like the storytelling a lot. I really like the idea that maybe someone says, yeah, this girl calculate the weight of Sao Paulo, or this girl has, a, there's this uh, one kilometer uh, iron uh, length, iron ore till the middle of the earth in Oslo. I like how things linger in the air and people talk to each other. And maybe I should say also because we're in Switzerland, there's one work that influenced me a lot and I really love, I never see. And it's actually, I think, a Swiss artist. It's a bit, I don't know, I don't hear so much about him lately. He's called Gianni Motti. And I was in Amsterdam like 15 years ago, and some Swiss friends told me, yeah, this Gianni Motti, there was a little earthquake in a village, and he appropriated. And I was like, what the hell? He appropriated an earthquake, you know? I was like trembling myself. Is this possible, you know? The question, the thing is so enormous, ambitious, stupid. Well, I don't know. I, I, I didn't even see the works. It's a work okay. someone told me that someone <laughs> no, did. Curious, yeah. <laughs> that is a storytelling by yeah. itself. That's why I tell you about it. But I still think about this work, uh, and I'm talking about it 15 years later. And it's, this is a very good example of storytelling. And I think it's a very poetical work. It's a terrible disaster, but it's very poetical. And I never see it. So in a way, I, I need, I really do the things. I need to do them. But uh, for me, how things can linger as a story is also a very powerful uh, thing on art. Uh, uh, and I think, yeah, I can also see it on your work. And I also must say, I also work with places. I, am, I, I love construction materials. I love concrete. I love wastelands. That's, I always work with places I really like very much because of their visual characteristic. So there is the, the very heavy politics on it, but there is also the love for places in my work. So do we have more questions? More comments? <laughs> huh? If not, I would ask you, would you like to say something else? Okay, so if not, we will um, we'll close it. All right, Luis? Oh, I, uh, despite the... the uh, the notion ecological art, I'm sure that it'll be a subject we will even see much more of. Yeah, for sure, for sure, yeah. Um, okay, so thank you very much. Um, thank you, the three of you, for participating, and thank you for the audience. Thank you.